Welcome back. It's time for another week of astronomy. Hope you guys are doing okay. I wanted to do a brief overview of chapters 10 and 11, which are the chapters we'll be studying this week, and also talk about the project we'll be doing on extrasolar planets. So let's jump into chapter 10 here. Let's see. Um, and uh, let me just tell you the basic issue here is how stars form and how they evolve. So the first thing to point out is that a star is, uh, is obviously a large ball of, of gas and uh, it forms from an interstellar cloud. Now there's a section that talks about the interstellar medium and how stars form. Interestingly, that's section 10.4. It doesn't happen until the very end of chapter 10. Chapter 10 begins with the discussion of what is the main physics that goes in in stars that causes them to behave the way they do. And I'm just going to summarize this idea. The point is, stars are the product of two competing processes. The first is the force of gravity that's trying to compress the star as much as possible. In other words, the weight of the star causes it to collapse. So gravity is constantly pushing down, 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 trying to make the star as small as possible. On the other hand, in the interior of a star is a nuclear reaction that is producing lots and lots of energy. That energy produces pressure, and that pressure opposes the force of gravity. So the more uh, energetic the nuclear reaction, the greater the pressure, and the greater the uh, opposition to pressure. The more mass the star has, the greater the gravity, and the uh, greater force there is pushing the star down. Now it turns out the greater the pressure in the interior, the greater the temperature, and the more energetic nuclear reactions are possible. So there's a sort of competing process here and it drives the whole business. So as you're reading the chapter, keep that idea in mind and see how it informs your understanding of what's going on. The, uh, the other thing is you need to learn a little bit about nuclear reactions and how they work. So I wanted to point out a picture which describes the nuclear reaction that is primarily responsible for the energy in our own sun, and that's the so-called proton-proton chain. Now it looks pretty complicated, but I just want to point out that basically what's going on is four hydrogen atoms are combining through an elaborate process to form a helium atom. I should say four protons, which are the nucleus of four hydrogen atoms, combine to form two protons and two neutrons, which is the nucleus of a helium atom. So hydrogen is getting converted into helium. In the process, uh, neutrinos are being produced. These are uh, tiny, low-mass particles, almost zero-mass particles, that interact very weakly with ordinary matter. And so these guys have been detected on the Earth, and there's a story that goes along with that, but the bottom line is it's fairly well understood now uh, how these guys are produced in this nuclear reaction. The other thing that gets produced are these so-called gamma rays. These are, of course, uh, electromagnetic waves that ultimately produce the light that we see. Now, they come in this nuclear reaction, they have very high energy. But in the process of making it their way out from the core of the sun, where this nuclear reaction occurs, to the photosphere, where we actually see them, their energy is greatly diminished. <clears throat> there are many more of them. Basically, what happens is you take a very high energy gamma, and you convert it through a long process of uh, absorption and re-emission into many, 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 many visible photons. So that's kind of the way that works. Let's go back to the contents now, and let's talk about the main sequence. So you know that the... Actually, let's go back. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. Let me do it this way. Uh, you know that... The main sequence is a part of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So what I want to do is to bring up a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This is a nice little animation. I encourage you to use it. It's in the uh, online book. The main sequence is this strip of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram right here. <clears throat> and uh, if we choose moderately small in this guy and say start, what it does is it uh, follows the path of a 
collapsing newly forming star and shows you how the thing evolves. So it starts out almost entirely hydrogen, I should say 75% hydrogen, something like that, and then um, as it evolves, as it converts more and more hydrogen into helium, the core of the star grows and that uh, what that does, it grows, I should say, the core doesn't grow, sorry. There's helium in the core that accumulates. Because helium is more massive than hydrogen, it collects at the center of the star, be because it's heavier, essentially. Um, but helium can't fuse at the same temperature as hydrogen, so this is called helium ash. It's ash because it's like uh, the when you burn wood in your fireplace, you burn the fresh wood and it produces ash, but the ash can't burn because the fire is not hot enough. So it just kind of piles up in the fireplace. It doesn't do any good. That's the same sense in which the helium is ash because it, at the temperatures where hydrogen burns, helium doesn't. And so the helium just acts as inert material. So the sun evolves, accumulating more and more helium ash. Oh, I had to start it over again, I guess. Uh, and you can see it's telling you how long this process is taking. The helium now accumulates, accumulates, accumulates. Eventually, the helium grows uh, so large that it completely fills the core. And then the star has to change to a new phase of evolution. And we're going to learn more about this next week. But basically, the thing becomes a red giant. So it leaves the main sequence. The main point of that story is that during the time when the star is actively burning hydrogen in the core and producing helium, it lives down here on the main sequence. All the stars in the main sequence are hydrogen burning. And so what it means is if we see a star in the sky and we identify that its luminosity class tells, it's on the, tells us that it's on the main sequence, we can tell right away just by looking at its temperature its absolute luminosity. And once we know its absolute luminosity, of course, we can determine its distance. So this is a strategy for measuring the distance to stars and also understanding their evolution. Now it turns out that low mass stars take a lot longer to burn their hydrogen, even though they have less of it, because the nuclear reaction is less energetic because the force of gravity is weaker in these lighter stars. It actually takes a lot longer for them to consume their fuel. So these guys live a long time, take a long time to evolve. These ones up here uh, evolve very quickly. Notice that uh, this one solar mass star, um, it took something like uh, 12 billion years to evolve. Now if I go to a very large star and I run it, it's, it very quickly uh, collapses and it does all kinds of crazy business. It builds up all these uh, different cores because as it runs out of hydrogen, it has enough mass to burn helium. It runs out of helium, it has enough mass to create carbon. It runs out of carbon, it has enough mass to make silicon, and so on. Now it turns out no matter how massive a star is, it can never burn iron. And the reason for that is iron is the most stable element in the periodic, I should say, it's the most stable nucleus. It turns out if you try to fuse two iron nuclei together to make something heavier, it actually requires energy. You don't get energy out. If you start with anything less massive than iron and you fuse those guys together to make something heavier, uh, you get energy out. So iron is the uh, terminal nucleus. You can never create energy by fusing iron. And so even the most massive star can never produce pressure by burning nuclear doing nuclear burning with iron. And so all stars ultimately end their evolution if for no other reason because they produce iron ash in their core and you can't actually produce energy from iron ash. So that's the reason all stars ultimately uh, end their life. We'll learn more about that in chapter 11. But the point is um, a one solar mass star like our sun lasts about 10 billion years, 10 to 12 billion years on the main sequence, whereas very massive stars live only a very short period of time. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go back to the table of contents and uh, 
let's talk a little bit about the death of stars. Basically, star death happens when stars run out of fuel, and um, I would like to talk about the two basic situations. If you have a light star that doesn't have enough mass to burn carbon, what you end up with is a planetary nebula. That is, when the star finally consumes all of the helium it can consume, it, it, uh, it doesn't have enough mass to burn carbon, the star essentially explodes and blows off most of its outer atmosphere. And what's left is the carbon core that was produced by helium burning in its giant star phase. And that guy is called a white dwarf. So our own sun will uh, meet such a fate in about five billion years. We're about halfway through the sun's evolutionary main sequence phase. And um, ultimately, the sun will end up as a white dwarf. The uh, it, more massive stars, very massive stars, will be able to burn carbon. And uh, like I showed in the last picture, you know, silicon and get all the way up to iron. When those guys die, they will produce a much more elaborate explosion called a supernova. So a supernova explosion, there's, there are actually two types. And the heavy star type is called the, um, let's see, it's uh, the type 2 supernova, which is, um, let's see, the type 2 supernova is for a heavy mass star that's highly evolved. Uh, the type 1 supernova is another type I'll talk about in a moment. But the point is, uh, the supernova explosion will pr is much, much, much more elaborate than the explosion of a uh, low-mass star running out of helium, and it produces all kinds of uh, elements. Most of the, <clears throat> a lot of the heavy elements that get produced in stars are spread out through space through these supernova explosions. And the end result is that what remains of the heavy star is either something called a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, neutron stars are very interesting. They're basically extremely dense objects made of nuclear matter. A black hole is so dense that even light cannot escape. So our next project that we do next week is going to be about the black holes. So. Uh, we'll learn more about those guys next week, but please do uh, read what this chapter has to say about these guys. The other thing I should point out is white dwarfs sometimes end up in binary star systems with um, stars that are not yet fully evolved. And when that happens, when, when these companion stars reach their giant phase, a thing can happen that's fascinating. The outer atmosphere of the uh, neighboring giant star can actually be drawn onto the white dwarf. So we get accretion of material onto the white dwarf. If the white dwarf accumulates enough mass through this process, it can actually become unstable and explode in another type of supernova explosion, so-called carbon detonation supernova, which is a type 1 supernova. And uh, these explosions can be also uh, extremely energetic and uh, these are, have been used recently to map the uh, size of the universe because they're very bright and because they happen at a particular point in the accumulation of mass, they happen to have an extremely uniform set of luminosities. And so you can use that to measure distance and then you can use that to measure uh, the evolution of the universe as a whole. So that's all there is to that. Let's talk a little bit about the project. So. The project this week let me, is uh, described here. It's the search for extrasolar planets. And I'm going to run this one very much like last week's project on the HR diagram. Oops, let's see. It looks like, uh, actually, there's a mistake. I need to, let me fix this right now. Holy cow. OK. Um, what I want you to do is to go to the link in resources and you should get the extrasolar planet document, not the not the HR diagram document. 
Let's see if that looks any better. Okay, read chapter 10 and 11. Those are the correct chapters. This project is similar to the HR diagram project, except we're going to be um, using the extrasolar planet document. You can... Uh, oh my golly. Okay, I'm, looks like I... Miss, I must have been too tired when I put this together. I uh, misnamed this thing. It's a document. It's not slides. So what I should do is call this the document. Sorry about that. It's not a. It's not a Google uh, Slides document. It's just a. Uh, word processing document, a Google Doc document. Okay, and uh, go through each question in the document and please ask if you have questions. I'm still not, I've not gotten all the HR diagram projects uh, and I have gotten no questions about that project. So please, if you're struggling with that one, let me know and ask some questions. But here is the extrasolar planet document. It's a Google Doc. And what I'd like you to do is go into the file menu and make a copy, and then edit the copy. That's the idea. Um, but basically, I go through the process of describing what how extrasolar planets are discovered. One of the strategies for discovering extrasolar planets is to watch the wobble in the Doppler shift of the star as it as it wobbles back and forth. If the star wobbles on one side, it produces blue shifted light. On the other side, it produces red shifted light. And you can measure the light, deduce the velocity of the star, and graph the velocity as a function of time. And the time between one peak and the next peak is called the period. And the amplitude of the oscillation, the maximum velocity, the relative velocity, compared to the average speed of the star, which is zero in this graph, um, is used to determine the uh, mass, essentially, of the other guy. Well, you use the period of the motion plus the amplitude of this wobble to figure out the mass. So I tried to describe all this in the document, and also um, I ask a bunch of questions that are intended to uh, determine how well you're understanding what the, what the thing is saying and how it works. You'll be using some of the skills we learned early in the semester, like Kepler's third law and the small angle formula and so on. Actually, the small angle formula doesn't really play a role in this project, but Kepler's third law definitely does. So you'll be using that guy. And um, here are some examples of extrasolar planets that have been discovered. And here are some graphs that represent those discoveries. And you're supposed to figure out which of these graphs corresponds to which of those discoveries by looking at the graphs and interpreting them. And uh, here are some other graphs of extrasolar planet discoveries and so on. So, And the final uh, ultimate goal of the project is to look at some data from a discovery and to go through the process of computing the orbital radius and the mass of this particular extrasolar planet pr uh, produced by this discovery. So the good news is this time I'm giving you the correct answer so you can really check your work and make sure you've got it right. And if you have trouble getting the right answer, then please ask. Let me, let me know what's going on. So that's the idea of the Extrasolar Planet Project. Um, I hope you guys have a great week. Sorry, guys, I forgot one thing I want to add. I put a link in the resources that points to the uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln Extrasolar Planets Lab, which is not uh, what I used for the document, but I did want to point out that there are some nice uh, resources here that you can use. So, for example, there are some pages here that talk about the center of mass, the Doppler shift, and how you detect extrasolar planets. We're using what's called the radial velocity method, which is to look at the wobble. There's another method that we're not using, which you still can read about, and uh, it's quite fascinating, is the so-called transit method. But I thought that would be too much to try to do both of those guys, so I picked this one. And this one's closely related to other work we've already done. But there's a nice simulator here that, uh, it's a flash gizmo, that allows you to simulate the motion of the star and see how it actually works. So you're looking at it from this direction, you see what the thing looks like, 
you can simulate what measurements might look like in that system. And you can fiddle with things like the inclination of the orbit, the mass of the star, uh, the mass of the planet, and so on, and see how that affects the observed uh, period and the observed shape of the wobble. So that's all. We'll see you guys soon.